Hello and welcome to the fungi and fermentation lecture. And I get really excited about this because when we look at fermentation, uh, first of all, we have to recognize this, this big theme. Every group of people across the planet figured out some way to manipulate fungi and bacteria in order to do fermentation. A fermentation is really straightforward. We get some kind of sugary input. We remove all of the oxygen and whether it's bacteria or fungi, they're going to take that sugar and then convert it into some kind of byproduct. And a lot of times that byproduct is going to be alcohols. So fermentation has been hugely helpful. And I would argue is one of the main reasons why the human species can persist and why we were able to grow to the numbers that we were able to grow to. Yes, agriculture was hugely important, but just because you grow the food doesn't necessarily mean that you can keep it around. A lot of the food products were going to be perishable. They would sit in big storage bins, potentially you, they were going to, to rot. So you, you're always fighting with the decomposers. You're always fighting to keep and preserve any extra plant products that you might produce. So if you could work out fermentation, you worked out a way to preserve those plant products. So when we look at fermentation, we could almost see fermentation as being a subversive activity. At this day and age, at this point, if you know how to do fermentation, if you know how to grow and preserve your own food, you are now outside of the systems that we have created. You are in charge of your own inputs. The number one thing that's going to be important to you outside of oxygen and water will be food. If you can control and maintain that input, you control your life. So fermentation is a very, very powerful process. It's a powerful process to be knowledgeable about, and it is incredibly deadly if you screw it up. So uh, if you decide to get into fermentation, uh, please make sure to consult the experts, pay attention to what they are saying, and always be aware uh, that you have the potential to do damage to yourself and do damage to others. But clearly, humans have been doing fermentation for as long as we have records of humans and the process of fermentation, and they didn't kill very many of them. We were able to keep populating the planet. So while there is a risk, we also understand that that risk is fairly low, uh, because cultures have been doing this for a long period of time before they knew about all of the toxins and all of the problems that can occur. We now have that knowledge and we can be much more precise when we are first learning about fermentation and then uh, fermenting things ourselves. I personally have started getting really into playing around with microbes. Uh, nobody's dead yet and I haven't made myself sick. So yay to that. Uh, and it's really, really, really fun, but the mistakes can be disgusting. <laughs> Let's not lie. Uh, this is this is quite the process that we are manipulating. So when we look at fermentation, um, some of the things that we're going to be looking for is when we are using fungi to do fermentation and when we are using bacteria. Now at the beginning of the lecture slides, we start with looking at fermentation to produce alcoholic beverages. Again, the big theme is that every culture seems to have found some kind of sugary plant juice in their environment that they could then ferment and make into an alcoholic beverage. So the classic ones that we have are wine, and wine is just taking grape juice, adding some yeast, removing the oxygen, so you force those yeasts to do fermentation. They'll break down the sugars and turn those sugars into alcohols. Generally, red wines are going to make uh, red grapes are going to make red wines as we have with the Cabernet here, and then white grapes are going to make white wines with this Riesling that we have here. Now, I did bring these two bottles up for you intentionally because if you are backpacking and hiking and you are concerned about weight and waste, these, uh, this brand has, and most of the box wines are, are very good. Um, they're very palatable and this can be very nice for your camping and hiking and backpacking trips. Minimize the waste increase the fun. When it comes to white wines, this is one of the few Rieslings that's not super sweet. It's from a winery in Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, the, the very mountainous region, and lots and lots of drainage because the grapevines love to have consistent water, 
but they don't like their feet wet. So that's why you see a lot of times uh, vineyards being planted on hills because that water is always draining away. You've got to make sure you have consistent rainfall, but with the nice drainage, then the, the plant roots won't rot and the plants will be healthier. The other thing that I really like about this wine, and this was the first time I was able to taste it, uh, where this vineyard is, is located, it's an old fossil bed. And the interesting geology gives a flavor to the grapes, which then gives a flavor to the wine. And you can really taste it in their different wines. I know a lot of labels will talk to you about mineralogy or blackberry flavor, or hints and aromas of chocolate. And while they can be really fun and entertaining, um, a lot of us are not going to taste it or smell it. Um, we just don't have that refined palate or, or even the interest or care. If it tastes good, that's all we care about, and that's fine too. Um, but I did notice that this was one of the few times where I was like, oh yeah, okay, I see, I get this sort of um, tasting and flavoring that can happen with some of the wines. I don't always get it according to what the labels say, but that's part of the fun, uh, is then going out and experiencing all of the different wines. And I strongly encourage you to go to vineyards, talk to the people who are making it, growing the grapes, and learn about the whole process. It's unbelievably intense. Can't believe it's as cheap as it is. So we've got wines. Um, if we were to take grains and ferment those, uh, those grains like wheat, barley, and rye could be used to make beers. And then we can take wines and beer and any type of liquid made from a fermented plant and go through the distillation process. And that's where we have things like this scotch here, where the grains have been first fermented. And instead of just turning it into beer, we let the process keep going, let those alcohols intensify, and then put the liquid into barrels and give those barrels, uh, give that the barrels uh, that give the, the liquid some flavor as well. Um, there's a lot of crappy scotches and whiskeys out there. And I would encourage you and your friends, if you're going to start to get into whiskeys and scotches, to have a tasting party. Everybody buys one bottle and you can get a better feel for what your palate enjoys and what you particularly like. Um, I would say that this one is one of my favorites and one of the few that's not going to scald your throat all the way down and make you feel like you shouldn't have done that the night when you wake up the next morning. In uh, Central America, the agave plant that we talked about when we talked about making fabric, you can take those leaves and turn it into sisal fabric. And then you can take the stem and you can ferment the juices from the stem and get tequila. Or you could take that stem and burn it and kind of give it some char. And when you burn it and give it some char uh, and then ferment it, then you're going to get mezcal. Notice that this mezcal does not have a worm in the bottom. That's not really as much of a thing as we like to think it is. Get the mezcal that does not have the worm. Um, get the stuff that's really expensive. It tastes better. So in the first part of the lecture, we talk about using fruit juices and grains and getting those sugars making some kind of alcoholic liquid, and then you could take that next step and go through distillation to concentrate the alcohols and also concentrate the flavors, giving us the wide range of alcohols that we see on our shelves. Now, surprisingly, you'll notice that very little of this table is dedicated to that process of fermentation, because while that is fun and important, and alcohol can be seen as a medicine itself, not only as a, an anis, uh, as being able to uh, clean the area of debris and make it more sterile. Um, but also we've got alcohol serving as kind of an anesthetic before we had official anesthetics. Um, we're going to devote more of our time today, or I would like to devote more of this lecture, to talking about how we use fungi and bacteria, bacteria for preservation and in the fermentation process. So generally, when we think about fungi, we get into the edible fungi, like the little white butt button mushrooms or these little uh, baby bellas, these little baby portabellas, or something like these little, uh, these dried shiitake mushrooms, or these little uh, button mushrooms, these little straw mushrooms that are growing here. Those are all quite delicious. We have lots of edible fungi in our area as well. Um, things like the puffball, and morels, and of course, oyster mushrooms, um, and some of the hen of the woods mushrooms. So there's a lot of edible 
mushrooms in our area, please, 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 if you are going to do harvesting in any natural area, make sure that you know what you are harvesting. There is a false morel that looks very similar to the morel and produces toxins. And of course, some of those toxins could be deadly or cause some severe sickness. So be very careful if you're going to be harvesting uh, edible mushrooms from the wild. Always safer to buy it from the store where uh, they have the liability should anything happen. But of course, fermentation occurs for so many, we use fermentation in so many other ways. And specifically, we use fungi to do fermentation uh, in multiple different ways as well. I think the the way that we think of um, fun, fungi being used for fermentation is in the use of yeast. And our yeast can be used for uh, long-term fermentation in a lot of our bread products, or this Sarcomyces um, cerveciae species in this jar here could be used to ferment for alcoholic beverages. It's a very common species. If you wanted to, you could collect your own yeast from the environment. And what we have in this bowl is we have a sourdough culture. This is the Crust and Crumbles sourdough mother. They gave a portion away in a class that they held several um, years ago. They collected wild yeast from Rockford and they've been cultivating that yeast now for many, many years. And now I've been cultivating it in a sourdough culture. I've got this sourdough um, culture, these yeast, waking up, getting ready to do some uh, fermentation. That way I can make some bread over the weekend. So that's a very common way to use yeast in fermentation. In the lecture slides, I show you tempeh. And with tempeh, we use uh, different species of fungi in order to start to ferment the beans. And what they're doing when they're fermenting the beans is they're going to start to make some of the proteins and nutrients available to us that aren't necessarily available through cooking. So whether we're using yeast to ferment flours, like the, the uh, wheat flour here, the bread flour here, or whether we're using yeast with the beans and tempeh, what we have discovered is that this fermentation process makes nutrients available to us, makes the food that we're eating much more valuable. I love making tempeh and I love eating tempeh as well. A couple other fun ways to preserve or uh, ferment beans is through the use of um, molds in order to turn those beans into soy sauces. Uh, here we have tamari. And the thing about this is that when you, when you have soybeans that have been fermented with the molds to make true soy sauces, it is this intense, delicious flavor. Mm. Wow. It's so meaty. It's so delicious. It's not like that watery kikoman stuff. This is intense. So similar to what we see with our alcohols, the more you pay, the better the product. Probably it costs more because it's been fermenting for longer. It comes from a strain of fungi that have been fermenting beans for potentially hundreds of years. And so you get that really delicious, intense uh, flavor. The other thing that people will do when fermenting soybeans and using fungal mold is they can make this paste and there's several different versions. There's a red uh, miso. This happens to be the white miso. There is a yellow miso. There is a black miso. They all have very different flavors. It depends on the type of fungus that's been used, how long it's been allowed to ferment. Mm. Mm. Wow. And whether it's been added to um, any other container to finish out its fermentation. And this gives such an intensity to soups and broths and dishes. Really, really, really awesome. Before I end talking about using fungi for fermentation, I need to dig a little bit here in my olives. I need to get down to the black olives because olives, these droop fruits, they are completely inedible, super, super bit bitter. They have this olic acid. And until you get the uh, endocarp hiding the seed inside, 
till you get that pit out and you have just mezzo and exocarp, the olives are just bleh. They're, they're inedible. Why would anybody eat this? But you get rid of that pit. You start to ferment these with um, fungi and you get these delicious black olives. Mm. Wow. Again. Intense, amazing flavor from the fermentation process, and you make something that was inedible, edible, and you get to store it for a really long period of time. Now, the reason I put these olives here in the middle is because this is going to help us bridge fermentation using fungi to fermentation using bacteria. So, if we were to take olives and do a fermentation with bacteria, then we would get green olives. Mmm. Wow. Distinctly different flavor. But you got the same result. You take an inedible fruit, you make it edible, and you get to preserve it for really long periods of time. Now, some of the other places where we see bacterial fermentation, remember when we talked about teas, and we talked about the pure tea, and taking the leaves of the, the tea plant, breaking them up and allowing them to do a fermentation. Depending on how long you let that fermentation go, you can get a very intense flavor, a very different flavor than what you get from green tea, which is really more akin to what the plant itself would taste like if you just dry it out and pour some hot water over it. Another place where we see fermentation with bacteria uh, will be in a lot of our hot sauces. So here we have some, some Red Hot, and I know Tabasco, and a lot of different hot sauce companies will alter and change how long they are fermenting their product with um, bacteria in order to get different flavors. And how can I talk about bacterial fermentation without also talking about uh, the vinegars? And yeah, I'm gonna drink some vinegar here because you take some white wine, and this is a white wine vinegar, and you allow some bacterial contamination, which technically you don't want because really you wanted wine. Mm. Wow. And you get a vinegar if you get some bacterial fermentation. Now here I have a balsamic vinegar. This started as a wine and was aged in oak barrels for 30 years. It is quite syrupy. It has this really intense, deep color. Oh, and this flavor. Mm. Wow. I mean, wow. That's just spectacular. Every time I try it, I just, I want to I drink the whole bottle. If you have not done so, I encourage you to go to one of those vinegar stores and they um, have little cups and sometimes they'll have like little spoons that you can throw away. And you can do a tasting of all the different types of vinegars and realize that that white vinegar stuff that most of us have been using, uh, whoa, there's so much better stuff and so many more interesting things out there. This is a malt vinegar. Maybe you've put malt vinegar on french fries or potatoes. And this is oftentimes made from beer or a grain-based alcohol. And again, very, very different flavor than the white wine and the balsamic. Mmm. Yeah. That's, uh, that's delicious. That's some good stuff. Just wish I had some French fries. So fermentation with bacteria in order to make a lot of our vinegars. I'm going to shift over here to the idea that you can make some of your own yogurts at home. And if you are not interested in, in mimicking the dairy yogurt, and some of the things that make us a little squeamish when we think about the dairy yogurt concept is that the rennet that's used to make dairy cheeses and also um, can be used in making yogurts, that's essentially mimicking some of the bacteria and enzymes that were found in, in calf stomachs. And so sometimes we get a little squeamish. I think almost all our cultures now are coming from um, really controlled environments and that we don't have like people harvesting it from from baby calf bellies anymore. Um, but maybe you're like, I'll just go with the vegan route, get my cultured bacteria, 
and start making my own yogurt at home. So those exist out there. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward and easy process. Once you've got your culture started, you can keep using the, the yogurt uh, bacteria from one batch to add to the new batch to add to the new batch. In other words, you may only have to buy these cultures once, and then you should be able to keep it going, keep the fermentation process happening potentially for the rest of your life. It used to be that you would then pass those cultures on to your children, to your grandchildren, to other people um, in your community. Things like sourdough starters, uh, tempeh starters, the cultures for yogurts and cheeses, those things have been passed down from generation to generation, uh, potentially for hundreds of years. So some of the products that we can also make with these vegan cultures are things like uh, ricotta cheeses, some of our softer cheeses, cream cheeses. It's just amazing what people can do. And these are vegan, being uh, the Kite Hill specifically is using uh, almond milk. So basically squeeze an almond, get almond juice, and then once you have the almond juice, add some cultures, allow it to dry a little bit, and you get these thickened um, cheese-like products with that distinctive cheese-like tang that we've come to associate, and that's really the byproduct of fermentation. There are either even vegan cultured butters out there, again, primarily using coconut and using things like cashews or almonds, um, in this case, oat milk, in order to make those. And coming up here to our sauerkraut, and here we're using bacteria to preserve uh, cabbage. We could also use bacteria to preserve cabbage in the form of kimchi. Looks like every culture that had cabbage available figured out some way to ferment it. And I love this because this one says old fashioned. And I know that what that means is that this is definitely cultured with bacteria. And if I wanted to, I could use those bacteria and keep this going, always having a crock of sauerkraut around. But maybe you're one of those people where you have that distinctive tang and that turns you off. You're like, whoa, too overpowering. And note that that is the uh, byproduct of fermentation. That tang means you probably did it right and indicates, um, indicates that you, you've got a, a good product, even if it tastes a little strange to your palate initially. I wanted to end with a very fun fermentation type project that I, that I have started here. What I have in this container is I have some uh, grains. It's wheat berries, so not true berries. It's the grain of the wheat plant. And I'm soaking them. And I will then uh, add just enough water and allow bacteria cultures to grow and feed off of the sugars in these grains. The end result, the end liquid, will be something called rejuvelac. That rejuvelac liquid can be used to make yogurts, make cheeses, and so essentially what I'm doing is I'm starting the process of getting the cultures that I need to make yogurts and cheeses to do that preservation. Now, whether I use dairy milk or whether I use plant juice like soy milk or oat milk, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to preserve things for a much longer period of time and then to get some of that flavor that we, we tend to really like and associate with some of the cheeses. If you start to fall down the rabbit hole like I have done, I strongly encourage you to look into Nomi. This, uh, I'm sorry, Noma. The Noma Guide to Fermentation will tell you everything you need to know, the equipment you need to get, what you need to watch for when mistakes are happening and things go wrong. Uh, in other words, how not to kill yourself and kill others. And it is really, really good. I will tell you that in getting into fermentation, you're probably going to get uh, a minor in chemistry and a minor in microbiology, not just through the successes, but also through the mistakes, because you have to figure out what you did wrong in order to not do it again. This is really hands-on, practical, um, practical experience in science and biology. And, you know, it gives you that capability. It gives you the power to preserve and to um, really take control of a part of our life that, that a lot of us have, have outsourced to larger companies like Monsanto and Archer Daniel Midland and Syngenta, Kellogg's, all of those major companies that provide the food for us. And there's something really empowering about being able to make your own food, 
grow your own food, to have the knowledge of what kind of plants can be used if somebody were to have a bacterial infection. If it was an E. coli or staph back, uh, infection, you could rub raw garlic on it and know that you had a chance of at least being able to help them if you couldn't get any antibiotics from the pharmaceutical company. If you looked at a moldy orange and knew that that kind of white and green mold was the penicillium fungi making the antibiotic penicillin. This kind of knowledge is so powerful. And I don't know where you're going to use it in your life, if it's just, you know, to win trivia at a bar and impress the rest of the family later on, whatever it is, you made it to the end of the semester. You've learned a lot about agriculture, how we used to do it, what we did before we had agriculture, how we do agriculture now. The main stuff that we grow, we really got into the botany, how plants grow, that really plants only have three organs, stem, leaf root. They modify them and do all kinds of funky things with them, like modify a leaf to be a flower, modify leaves to be fruit. We got into the details of pollination and some of the genetics. We really covered a lot of ground this semester. And then here we are at the end. And I, I just want to say congratulations. You made it. You put up with me. You got all this stuff, stuff, all this information and stuff stuck in your head. And Hopefully you hung on, maybe you were white knuckling it the whole time, maybe you were rocking it, and a lot of this stuff sticks with you for the rest of your life. But I just want to say thank you for taking this class, for your time, for your effort, and if you ever have any questions, you know when and where to find me, track me down, and uh, good luck in your future endeavors. Make sure to take time to celebrate all of your successes. Congratulations on making it to the end of the semester.